Okay. Can everybody hear me okay? okay? Yes. A little louder? Okay. I don't know if I'll be able to talk this loud the whole time, especially when you get in code. It's tough. Is is everybody here write code or you learn or you who who by show of hands is learning? Learning. Yeah. Well, okay. All right. Uh, so that's the Oh, was it? Mm -hmm. Oh. Right. Hey, I got Doug up there. Hey, Doug. How do I get myself up there? It's all of that. Hey, everyone else sees you. We see you. Okay. All right. Well. When you're talking, it'll show you that. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep, just hit, got it. And then, like I said, oh, okay. I'll switch up. Yeah, to start All right. If not, they will be seen, yeah. Okay, so my name is John Boynton. Uh, I am an internet technology professional, which means I write web apps and I've been doing it for a while. Uh, I started developing software professionally in the late 90s. Uh, after I learned how to write in Java. Uh, back then I wrote Java applets. One of my applets actually got ranked in the top 5% uh, of the internet. Uh, and after that, I got some job offers uh, and I took one of them. I've been writing professionally ever since uh, and also as an entrepreneur. Um, Right now, I'm working with my company, datamessenger.com, to develop a distributed database for IoT devices. Uh, if you work with Arduino or Raspberry Pi, you're going to love this database. If I ever finish it, uh, hopefully it'll be out later on this year, possibly uh, late fall. I'd also like to do some shout outs to uh, Southwest Floor Coders. Um, Thank you for inviting me to speak and thank you to Zarella and Crystal for hosting a uh, round of applause. Uh, also, I'd like to shout out to Pi Southwest Florida. I have an announcement on them at the end of the program. Uh, Southwest Florida Tech, I've been a, a, a member of Southwest Florida Regional Technology Partnership for a number of years. Uh, they uh, were formed to help develop the technology sector in Southwest Florida. I'd also like to say something about FIRST. I volunteer for FIRST. Uh, their mission is to inspire young people to pursue careers in STEM and STEM leadership. Uh, and they do that by hosting robotics competitions. Uh, if you've ever seen a robot competition with kids in school, uh, grade school through high school, you are probably watching a first event. Um, if you have kids or grandkids interested in science, technology, engineering, or math, I recommend checking out firstinspires.org. Okay, art of transpiling. So uh, what we're gonna be talking about tonight is uh, what is transpiling? Why do we do it? How do we do it? I have a, an example of transpiling that we're going to do in JavaScript. We're going to take some JavaScript and we're going to turn it into um, Python. We're going to do that by hand. Hopefully we will get it done. Uh, after that, I might do a brief introduction into an application called JS Convert, which is uh, a transpiler uh, that is open source on GitHub. But first, I want to tell a story. So uh, the story begins at the end of the 18th century, around 1799. This is after the American Revolution. Napoleon's running around Europe. All the Europeans are all crazy about what is coming out of Egypt. Uh, Napoleon is so excited about all the stuff coming out of Egypt, he sends his army down there to help do some scientific investigation. <laughs> um, and the reason they were all excited is because to them, 
ancient Egypt was the cradle of civilization. Now we know that uh, there are many cradles of civilization, uh, but to them, uh, Europeans at the time, Western civilization, ancient Egypt was the cradle of civilization. Now, the thing that they, they were getting was they were getting all these uh, statues and monuments and artwork and everything had writing on it uh, because the ancient Egyptians were very good at writing things down. Problem was no one could read it. Um, until one day, someone found this, a, uh, an officer in Napoleon's army. The name was Pierre um, Francos Bouchard. Found this, he was working outside of a town of Rashid in the Nile Delta. It looks like you're sharing the wrong screen, not my screen. Thank you. It looks like it's only sharing the public comment. Yes. I don't want to interrupt. Hey, that's good. Good enough. It's crystal. Wait, wait, wait. It's at the very top. What's hitting that? Oh, that button. Mm -hmm. Great. There you go. Is that Sharon right? People online, is that Sharon right? Yes. Okay. So, um, so Pierre found this rock. Uh, he, I say he found it because he, he didn't find it in a museum. He did not uh, dig it out of the sand. He did not find it in a cave. Uh, he literally found it in a pile of construction material that the French were using to build a fort, uh, construction material. So what he noticed was that there were three types of script on this uh, rock and they were all different. Uh, the, the top script and the middle script were ancient Egyptian. Uh, it was the kind of stuff they'd been finding all over the place and couldn't read. But the bottom section was ancient Greek. Now, they didn't have people who could read the Egyptian, but they did have people who could read the Greek. It took them about a year. Uh, they were able to figure out what the Greek said. And from what they did know about the Egyptian, they worked out that all three sections said the same thing. Uh, they were all a decree from King Ptolemy V. Uh, from 2,000 years earlier. Now, the town of uh, Rashid was not called Rashid at the time, it was called Rosetta. And this is, of course, the Rosetta Stone. Uh, and this is what it would have looked like if he had found it in a museum. Um, now, it took a while, about 20 years, for them to actually figure out all of the it's Egyptian. When they did, they found out that the top, the, the, the middle section, was what was called the demotic script. It was the popular script. And it had phonetic characters that, that were used to spell people's names, kind of like our, our alphabet does. But the top part was very different. It was hieroglyphic. It used pictures, it used symbols. It was code. So my point here is that the ancient Egyptians were not translating speech, they were transpiling code because that's what transpiling it is, is it is taking uh, source code in one language and translating it to source code in another language. Now, so my, my point here is to say that, hey, transpiling is actually important. You don't really think about it very much, but we can use it for many different things. And at least in case of the uh, Rosetta Stone, it was important enough that it helped save the entire recorded history of ancient Egypt, uh, and by extension, the history of Western civilization. So I would say that's pretty important. Uh, so now on with the talk. Um, Java is not the only language I've learned over the years. I've, I've learned, uh, worked with BASIC and Fortran and Perl, uh, a little C-sharp, uh, JavaScript, the original JavaScript, uh, ECMAScript, uh, Python, 
uh, PHP, JSP, ASP, so on. And now I'm not a savant, uh, but what I do know is I know a little bit about how to transpile code. And that's what we're gonna be talking about tonight. So what is transpiling? So as I said before, transpiling is when you take source code at one level of abstraction and translate it into source code at another level of abstract or another at the similar level of abstraction. So uh, I guess uh, you could say it's compiling, you could say it's transcoding, you could say it's translating, but it's really not. Those are different words. Compiling is taking uh, source code at a high level and translating it to a lower level. Uh, transcoding is actually working with bytecode. So you take a, a, a GIF image and you turn it into a JPEG image, transcoding. Translating uh, is, of course, the, the act of doing these things. So here's a definition for transpiling, kind of scraped from the internet. Um, it says the same thing. You guys can read it. Um, So why do we why do we need to transpile things? So here are a few reasons or four reasons. Uh, we can transpile things for compatibility, for extendability, for reusability, or reliability, right? So taking these one by one, compatibility. If you use like JavaScript, um, you probably also use Babel. Babel is embedded within um, uh, with within your bundling applications, and it will take your high level JavaScript uh, that is new, that's fresh, the one you like to use, and it will it will transpile it into an earlier version of JavaScript that is more compatible across browsers. Uh, also, if you use TypeScript, TypeScript is designed to be transpiled to JavaScript, uh, and it does that for compatibility. Not everyone has TypeScript, but they all have JavaScript, and, and Microsoft was very smart to say, let's, let's not change the existing uh, programming language. Let's, let's do it this way. Um, Kotlin does the same thing with Java. Um, extendability, if you use AWS, if you use, uh, if you've ever done a, uh, a e-commerce with say Stripe, they all have an API and they want everyone to use that API. So they have it in several different languages. So they really have transpiled versions one for Java, one for JavaScript, for C Sharp, um, Python. I think uh, uh, Stripe uh, ha uses has Rust, um, different different versions. So they want to extend the language, but they 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 want it to be uh, understandable to many many people, or use used in their projects. Then reusability. Obviously, if you've written nice pieces of code in one language you get a job working on, on another project, you're still gonna have the same problems. If you've written that code before, you can reuse it if you know how to transpile it to a new language, the language that you're using in that product. Uh, reliability, uh, going back to reusability, if you've transpiled your code, you've already hammered on it. You've, you've iterated it, you've debugged it, you've, you've made the algorithms as good as you can make it, you make it, uh, working with the APIs and everything, why not reuse that? It's much more reliable to simply reuse that code that you've already created. It's also easier to find bugs. If you have a bug in, in, in a version that you've written in JavaScript, it's probably also there in Python. Okay. So is all transpiling the same? Um, this is kind of a strange question. There are different reasons you might want to transpile, different approaches, um, transpiling priorities, machine interpretability, human interpretability. These are things I look at. Uh, you think of, you think of uh, Babel, that's machine interpretability. If you ever go and look at transpile JavaScript written uh, by Babel, it's incoherent. They've changed the names, they've, they've moved, the, moved it around, they've used uh, uh, what are called polyfills. You really don't know what's going on. TypeScript is a little better. Uh, it looks a little kind of advanced when you read it. It's not exactly the same or as easy to read as the TypeScript, but it's a little better. Human interpretability, if you want to write an API, you definitely want people to be able to see it 
the same way across languages. So that's going to be the, the focus. That's going to be your priority because you want uh, to write, you want someone who learned the JavaScript version of your API to also be able to use the Python version without having to do extra learning. Okay. Uh, how do we do it? You know, what's, what's, what's the secret sauce here? Um, I kind of take the approach uh, that you can break down uh, your language into uh, abstract um, categories. Uh, but you might think that you could take uh, all of your languages and you could break it out and you could say, well, here are the things in languages that are always the same. Uh, and we'll take those, we can put them aside. We don't have to think about them again. They're always the same. For example, you might see that uh, the equal sign, uh, whoops, clicked on the wrong button. Uh, you might see that the equal sign uh, is in every language. It always means if you have a variable on one side, an expression on the other, the expression is being assigned to the variable, pretty much works. Maybe there's some rare forms of B and F that don't do that, I don't know. Uh, you might also say that the, another difference or another thing that is the same is, um, no, it's just that the equal sign is the only thing I have to say. Looking around, looking around. Everybody says, well, there's gotta be other things that are the same. Well, how about like the plus sign, right? The plus sign is gonna be in every language, except you might have a plus that adds integers. You might have a plus that adds strings. You might have a plus that adds uh, an integer and a string, and it gives you a string with an integer in it, except if you did that in Python, that would be an error, because Python will only add strings, it will only add integers to integers. So what I really want to do is I want to break down a language into abstract categories. And here are the categories, and you're, these are going to look uh, familiar. Syntax, operators, keywords, features, libraries. Uh, there are some others, people do it differently. And I say these are abstract because some things like keywords may also be operators. Some things like features may also be syntax. But the, these are the categories I, I, I break it down. So if I'm gonna learn Python um, and I know JavaScript, I'm gonna first look at my syntax. How is that syntax different? So I can compare that. Then I'm going to look at operators. How is the operators different? How are the keywords different? Features and libraries. Now, syntax, of course, here's a, here's a definition from Wikipedia. Uh, set of rules that define a combination of symbols that are considered the extreme. Blah, 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 blah. I think a better definition is stuff that uses these things. Applause here, laughter, I don't know. Um, so we use syntax to create blocks of code, conditions, loops, so on, define statements, uh, declare variables. Some people might say this is a feature. I like to look at this stuff as syntax. So uh, instantiate objects. All these things are kind of things that syntax. Uh, operators, of course, symbols. Operators represent actions, processes. Here are some operators. We're all familiar with these. Uh, Boolean operators, interestingly enough, uh, if you use JavaScript, you've got the double and and the double pipes, and that means and and or. Um, Python doesn't use those. Python uses the word and, and it uses the word or. Uh, it doesn't have that not symbol either. It uses the word not. So sometimes even operators are different. Keywords, um, you know, reserved by language for specific purposes. Uh, sometimes keywords are reserved, but never used. Um, here's a, a list of JavaScript keywords and a lot list of Python keywords. You notice there's a big difference between these lists. I've included keywords that are no longer used or keywords that used to be reserved that are not reserved. That's why the JavaScript is, is so big. For example, uh, go to. Uh, Go to is is no longer um, reserved in JavaScript. Don't know why. 
it was originally reserved because it was a bad idea and they didn't want people using it. Back in the day when we wrote in, in basic, go to meant you would go to a particular line. Uh, and obviously if you added some code somewhere along the ways, your lines would change and everything would break. Uh, that's why if you look at old code, it goes 10, 20, 30, doesn't go one, two, three. But we needed that extra space. Uh, features. Now this is this is really uh, getting to be a big thing. What are what are features? Uh, a distinguishing characteristic of software items, e.g., performance, portability, and functionality. This is the source for this definition is the IEEE, which is the Institute for Electrical and Electronic Engineers. Um, so here's what I consider to be features: data types, loops, conditions, statements. Again, Booleans, it's in both. Um, collections like maps and sets, every language has collections, but they have different names for them. In JavaScript, an array uh, is, is what we think of as an array, but in Python, it's called a list. Uh, a, a map is, is something that uses key value pairs in JavaScript, and in Python, it's called a dictionary. All right, so every language kind of has these things. Built-in functions, built-in functions in, in uh, JavaScript, for example, uh, parse int uh, will take a string and turn it into a, an integer. In Python, we have the same built-in function, but it's just called int, I-N-T. Okay, so, hey, that, that's better. A suite of or libraries, a suite of data for programming. This is this is the big kahuna, right? Everything else I've talked about, you can learn in a couple hours at most, maybe even sooner. Libraries can take years. Uh, when I learned Java, the first version of Java I learned had 400 class files. It took me a while, but I learned all 400. And then they came out with the next version of Java it had 1,600 class files. It took me a lot longer to learn those. Uh, and then they came out with the next version of Java. It had 2,400 class files. I did not learn them all. I still have not learned them all. So how do you, how do you distill your libraries down into something that's manageable? And I, I, what I do is I just look at the, um, oh, here's some examples of libraries. Uh, this is how I, I look at libraries that do these things, that, that look at language, that look at utilities. Uh, IO, cryptography, and networking. So every language has numbers. Every language has strings. Uh, many languages have exceptions. Uh, so I'll look at these first, really important in anything you're doing. Utilities like my collections or formatting, I'll look at those. IO, I'll look at how a language uh, opens files, how it reads bytes. Uh, cryptography, if you're doing internet stuff, you need to know how, how are you going to do your your hashes and how you're gonna do your uh, public and private key encryption. Uh, and then networking, how, to, how are you gonna use your URLs? Uh, so those are my, my categories. I'll look at, I'll take a language that I don't know. I'll, I'll try to look at these categories and I'll be able to compare them to a language I, I do know. So doing that is the art of transpiling. So, I guess next I need to uh, do some sample code. Am I still sharing? Yeah. Now for this demonstration, I'm gonna be using Eclipse IDE. Um, it's not my favorite, but it's, it is open source. Uh, it is well-maintained um, and it 